Welcome to Breaking the Chains. I am Bakita, and today I'm with Titus and Tyree, or Tyree and Titus, however it looks on my screen. The one in the yellow shirt is Tyree, and black shirt is Titus. They are identical twins who have joined the repatriation uh, journey <laughs> with all of the rest of us. And today we're gonna talk about living on the land and what it's like to journey into Ghana and live off the land. Um, but first we'll have Titus and Tyree to introduce themselves, tell us a little about you all, and then we'll jump right in. Um, Tyree, if you would go first. Yeah, uh, I'm Tyree, we're from Alabama. Uh, we started going to Ghana in 2017. Um, We've been back and forth. This will be our fourth time going. And yeah, we're repatriating. It's, it's, it's what it is. Yeah. It's a journey. Thanks. <laughs> uh, right on. Like you said, I'm Titus. Um, and we just want to, you know, give our account of what we're going through and how we um making it over there. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to share our story. Thank you for uh, joining me. I know that this is um, this is a topic that I see a lot come up. People say they want to move to Africa and live off the land and all of that stuff. And people, I think people have a idealistic idea about what it looks like to move to Ghana and live off the land. But what I want to do is give them a realistic idea of what that could look like from you guys's experience your research um you have you started this whole journey um uh, with your your business research and um you guys have done the research so tell me what was it that um well titus can you tell me why did you all choose or what was it about living on the land why did why did y'all choose that um that route instead of the route that uh most of us tend to choose. Okay. Um, first, we wasn't really getting that many clicks on touring. And that was like, okay, what are we going to do here in Ghana? So um, then we realized that um, we wasn't, um, we, we didn't have a wide variety of food. Just, you know, it just became like mundane. We kept eating the same thing over and over and over. And it was just like, it was becoming a drag. And um, then we started bouncing around to other repatriates farms, you know, helping them out, helping them wherever they could. We went to Techimon, we went to um, Eastern region, and um, we went all the way to uh, Bourgeois in the, in the Western region, just working on other people's farms and realized that, you know, this, this, is, this is where it's at. You know, we have to uh, get land if we want to make sure we eat and what we want to eat. And, um, yeah, we just, that's the beginning of how, how it came about. And we, we had experience from, from the States as far as like, uh, you know, planting and greenhouse. So we just wanted to uh, keep that going. Okay. So um, Tyree, when you all got to Ghana, did you find it easy to um, transition from living in, um, like what we, I guess what we would call a, a modern situation or a regular situation then to um, transition into, and as Ghana would say, as people in Ghana would say, living in the bush. Uh, yeah, very much so. It's a, it was a very different thing, like living in the States compared to living in Ghana. First of all, we didn't come with like, a ton of money, you know what I'm saying? We didn't come to Ghana with like just money to blow or nothing like that. So uh, we started realizing that the common, you know, things like running water and uh, bathrooms and, in, in, you know, bathrooms in your self-contained house, like those were extra amenities that cost more um, mm -hmm. in Ghana. Like, so, you know, for the type of project housing set up in the States, you're gonna spend real money on in um in Ghana, especially in Accra and Kumasi. Um, so the more uh, and then they have the one year, the two year uh 
renting things. So you have to pay two years up front. And that's just way out of control when you think about, you know, how do you live in? Uh, do you even know the area? Do you got some, you know, Ghanaian liaison that's going to hold you down if it hit the fan? These types of things became like an issue um, as we was as we was out there. Yeah, we hit the skids, man. Many people in Ghana who know uh, who know us closely, uh, you know, from the diaspora, they they seen us in our highs and our lows. You know, we came with a um, like four other brothers, and many of them came back to the states because you know they hit the highs and lows and weren't able to bounce back. So it, it's it's not as easy as folks making it seem on YouTube. I just I just can't stress that enough. Yeah. Um, Titus, when Tyree talks about those highs and lows, um, can you give me an example of like one of the times where it was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know about this shit here. Man, when we first went out there, it's like straight trees and like it's <laughs> It ain't no nothing but big old tree, bigger than you are. And they hand you a cutlass. Like, my dude, word? That's what I got to, what? It's like, and you got to really take these trees out, man. And um, that jump, that is real work, man. These, like, shout out to the Ghanaians, man. They, they put it down when it comes to, like, clearing off land, man. And, um. You know, we we used to bulldozers and some some machine right. just come through that down, but uh, that was the realest. And then when we did it right after that, we both got malaria, so it was like a double whammy, like bam, bam. You know, and then you know after that, it's like you gotta dig a shithole. Like you yeah. have to. It was like real, real work that just didn't stop. And now to me, that was like. Uh, yeah, that, that was one of the lows, real lows, man. Yeah. So let me ask this. Um, let, I need you to like walk me through like how you go, how you got from, I get off the airplane, um, I go and stay, I get, I'm sure in a, 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 a regular house. Mm -hmm. And then who did you have to connect with so that you can, I guess, learn what it takes to uh, live in the bush in Ghana? Either one of y'all. Well, Tyree, can you answer this? Uh, really, uh, thinking back on it, it kind of depends on which time we went because we, we took <laughs> okay we took approaches um, in different situations that we went. Like the first time we went, it was kind of like, man, we just, we had a little bread to blow. So we was just going all over the place, like living Airbnbs, hotels, like just real frivolous with it. The second time we came, uh, that's when we stayed like a year straight. And uh, that like, we kind of ran out of money. Mm -hmm. So the types of stuff that you would do in the, you know, you would consider going to the bush when you can't afford a spot in Accra uh, or something like that. So we was going, you know, first just go out there and try to build or something, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But then we start to realize how long it takes to build. It's like, where you going to sleep while they building? Yeah. So um, then, you know, we got a situation in uh, Umasi area where we, you know, was working a project uh, about building the dome homes and people who's been following us, uh, um, since the beginning, they know we was trying to build sustainable dome homes and everything like that. So the project is still ongoing, but we we really couldn't afford to stay there either. And you know what I mean? As simple as you thought it was going to be, right? Exactly. So, um, you know, and dealing with people too, a different culture. So you go into a different tribe, you know, you might try to, you know, you just don't know how they do and how they operate. So if it, if it gets sketchy, you got to kind of push on. So It'll lead you into the bush when you're just trying to find like some, some kind of, you know, way to live. So, um, Titus, did y'all buy, did y'all buy some land, or did y'all just like have somebody that y'all knew who was um, letting y'all use the land? And second question to this is, when you went out there, did you go with like 
camping gear or was it like like how did that how did you go into because when I think of the, going into the bush I'm thinking like naked and afraid type of situation <laughs> um or survival type of situation so uh, and I'm sure it's other people who think of it like that um, also, but can you just like give me an idea of what it really looks like? Uh, yeah, we 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 rock the tents, um, the tents that we brought from the states. Um, that's that's basically how you start. It, there's no way around that, and you know that's that's how it is. And then you know you build you some some little um, bamboo structures to keep the rain off and different things like that. Um, but that's how you start. Um, we did that, we did that three separate times from scratch, which was, um, a couple of times we could have just, you know, toughed it out, but it was best that we, you know, get our own, like you said. So, well, um, we got the Ashanti region land, which is the land that we got, you know what I'm saying? We paid for. So, but, you know, things wasn't popping like that because we couldn't make no bread, you know? So mm -hmm. we had to keep on, uh, moving. Um, then we we leased out some some land like some farming land that you know different people can just like you know whatever just rent it out and like um, co-op farming yeah 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 and this and that's family land and the, and the Shanti land is stool land so it's a difference you gotta do yeah. your research at, and find out you know what what you want to do um, me and Tyree we kind of like nomads with it so we really didn't want to get into no serious like bonding you down you got to stay right here and plus um we really felt like we needed a, a Ghanaian like person to speak for us in in many of them type of situations you do Just, you know what I'm saying so we didn't really want to get in no serious serious uh situation like that until we found that person um yeah. it took a while to to even get a group of people that you know we can work with so um, that's so, how that went. Go ahead. Considering, you know, we, we know the majority of people in Ghana are looking to live the lifestyle that people live in um, Accra um, mm -hmm. or in Kumasi um, or even in Cape Coast. But um, how did you even find that community of people who was interested, like Ghanaians who are interested in in that? Was it like how did you do that? Uh, go ahead, bro. yeah, go ahead, bro. Uh, yeah, um, we found them like by really like throwing ourselves into the the community, like really engaging ourselves in different places, like. It's kind of hard, you know, um, but you just kind of do it when it's really, you know, it's putting yourself out there kind of thing. And uh, that's why we didn't put a lot of it online. You know, we really wanted to like, seem like we was with the people, you know, you pull out a camera and everything is, everything kind of changes. So yeah. we yeah. really went, went deep into the into the villages. We, we start hitting up the pubs. We start getting to know the chieftaincies and stuff like this. Is um, uh, then you know American people who's living there, diasporans, and you know from all over really, will kind of like introduce us to somebody or this is their person for that, and you kind of just hold on to those connections like real tough. You don't want to mess them up at all. So uh, we met a chief and the, the chief in the Ashanti region. Man, he's a solid brother. He spent a lot of times in the States and he really held us down, man. And I, I just thank the chief and he made, um, he made Henny, uh, he just held us down. And uh, other other people like uh, in the bourgeois thing, we was actually working with Europeans, you know what I'm saying? So it was a strange place to be, you know, mentally coming from the States all the way to Africa and still work with Europeans. But yeah, we learned a lot, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. and. And it wouldn't have been good for us to put that online. They'd be like, oh, look at these. I thought y'all was all black power. And then, but, you know, it's those types of things that we just wanted to be there, you know what I'm saying, and not worry about the outside and, world. You know, I think a lot of times our people um, need to understand that at the end of the day, we're not going to escape them just yet. 
um, and in a situation like what you all are doing, they are of the bigger community of people who are doing those sorts of things. They um, are really, you know, they out there. They they be they willing to do shit like naked and afraid. So right. you know, I don't know why they just keeps coming to my mind. But you know, you rarely see black people on there. And while you do see them a little one here, here, here and there, you'll see a black person on stuff like that. But if we're honest, it's not a lot of us who are just out there trying to um, really do it. They may want to, but understanding the 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 hows is 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 a thing um because you can't just run out in the bush because i'm just just my little scary self i just i'm all i could think of is what if what if a snake <laughs> what if a spider come like what if what if the damn i don't know what if something big come along what you do so like <laughs> Speaking of which, what do y'all do when you snakes and shit? Oh um, man, uh, we do what the Ghanaians do, man. We just, uh, we just, like for real, you gotta handle the snakes. You gotta take care of them. Um, but we didn't have too many of them. The the ones that was infesting was the scorpions, man. That's what was, that what was killer. Um, and yeah. we was, we was doing a composting thing. And I don't know if, if the uh they liked the compost or they like something that was eating the compost or whatever but they was everywhere oh everywhere see that i already know i as soon as i would have saw one i would have been like all right y'all it's been real <laughs> it's been real <laughs> i'd have been good with just one <laughs> so yeah. as soon as i would have seen one i would have been like all right y'all i tried it and yeah. yeah, it's a no dog. It's a no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I realized that too. And the one thing that was like giving me like fire on the bush and like we was working every single day just about. Um, but like I know that our people want all that stuff taken care of by the time they get there. You know what I'm saying? Just at yeah. least have some sort of bad stuff. So yeah, we was, you know, we was just grinding it out, man. And and like for real, it was healing for us. We didn't want to be over there doing the same things we were doing in the states. It yeah. was like we was man. We I know y'all to... was at one point. I remember seeing y'all was y'all locks was all y'all face was all y'all was looking like real bushmen for real. I was like these <laughs> these motherfuckers is done turned into real bushmen for real. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> that shit Jeez. was like I was like oh my God why why. But that's, that, that's why we didn't put it all out there. Like we didn't know how people was gonna react to it, and then you don't want to be the guys putting a bad name when everybody trying yeah. to say come, gonna come to God. Yeah, I don't think that it's a bad thing because there's a lot of people who, um, you know, when people always ask me, you know, how much it costs to move to Ghana, how much, and I, it's, I can't stress enough that you can't really put a number on it. Like, I can't tell you, oh, if you got $20,000, you can move to Ghana and be straight. Right. Or if you got $5,000, you can move to Ghana and be straight. If you want to live off the land, you can be straight. I can't tell you that because what your needs are, sometimes you don't even know what your needs are until you find out what your needs are. Right. Right? So speaking of needs, what in the hell did y'all eat out there? Oh man, shout out to the Ghanaian brothers, man. Um, them dudes, they can make all kind of. They um the the one land that we that we um that we was like share cropping with, I guess that would be the American term. Um, they already had like sweet potatoes planted and and like different stuff out there, but um, yeah, we we basically had a, a steady rotation of plantains um mad plantains i mean shh, so many and mangoes too man i i must have filled up on mangoes a million <laughs> yeah, i could <can laughs> do that but really? uh they um they cooked a lot man and um we just switched it up as, as best we could and um 
yeah, it's it's not it's not a lot of variety, and we didn't we didn't eat meat on the yard at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think our bodies had to get used to that too. Um, that's why we was you know getting under the weather with that um, malaria yeah. stuff. Um, yeah. but yeah, got to keep on them bitters, um, mad bitters when you out in that bush, cause you know that it, it's real, it's real, real. The the animals love us. We love the animals, but at the same time, you gotta keep your distance. Um, from from all insects, critters, anything. I, we don't we don't want any like fowls or, or birds. We don't we don't raise no animals at all. Yeah. Just so, to- what kind of? In my mind, I just I just see bugs everywhere <laughs> and all kind of animals. What kind of animals did y'all encounter? Like, cause you know and. Let's be real. You know, people always think because we in Africa, oh, did you see some lions and some tigers or some first of all, ain't no damn tigers in Africa. That's that's no. that's not the thing. But do y'all see elephants and all of this stuff? Like people really think that you moved to Ghana and it's just wildlife just roaming all over the place. But what was what would be you would say the most all this thing? Uh, we seen a civet cat. We seen uh, uh, the the youth called a p- pangolin. Uh, I, I I don't know how to say it right. Maybe pangolin, pangolin. It's like a armadillo thing. You oh. know what I mean? Uh, okay. Yeah, it was real real trippy looking thing. Wow. Uh, but they you know they was hold, they kept it like a little pet. What else did we see? You know that what's that rum roll with a monkey sanctuary where the bamboos are. Uh, come on the side, oh, Rose. Um, oh man, that's Cape Coast Road, ain't it? No, uh, main Cape Coast Road, or is it the um going to Cocoon? Uh, I, I think they might have some monkeys out there too, but I, I don't know. I think it's Samania, it's not Samania, it's headed it's not- to- baby. Where the um, the baboons be at? Going to the Adomi Bridge. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That we, we see them all the time. Me, yeah. Have you seen them out there? Yeah, they out there all no, the time. They ain't out there where we at in the in the bush though. They on that road yeah. for. But in the bush, it's just bush animals. Like you know, there's, there's rabbits out there. There's like bush meat. Uh, I don't know what they so call them. Grass, like grass cutters and stuff. Yeah. yeah they and, be out there. Them big lizards, they be out there. Um, oh, like the monitors? They look like little small alligators, like uh, yeah, crocodiles. Yeah, the monitors. Yeah. Oh, oh, hell no. Hell no. No, sir. No, man, no. My, no. Home, my homeboys be catching them mugs, man. They can't, they can't. Man, my homie. They say my homie. that's good. My husband say that's good meat. <laughs> <laughs> The pythons and all of that shit. They like, that's good meat. Man, I actually had um one time we were standing in front of our property in um uh, Budenborum and we like on the main road and these dudes come running across the street. They they coming, they getting it. And they like the the monitor, I guess he climbed over our wall mm. and they asking my husband, let us in the gate so they can go in there and get it. They came out there with that dog on monitor. I was like, oh my God, they got an alligator. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> they got a damn alligator. <laughs> it's, uh, they move too quick for me. I can't I can't deal with something that move that fast like that. I don't well, know homies- how they catch that kind of shit. Dang. Like, so, so y'all out there in the bush. Yep. Y'all pretty much eating like vegetables and stuff like that right yeah keeping it and now when you guys got malaria how did you tend to your malaria in the bush did you did you tend to it in the bush or did you go on and get some treatment well which time <laughs> i mean we caught it so like it it became like you know a thing like the first time we caught it was a uh, uh up in the eastern region that first maybe that second that first year we we was there and uh you know bro had to go to the hospital and the whole nine but then we had you know got the um, 
over the counter malaria test things, you know what I'm saying? So we'll go and get those to just make sure you was you were straight. But if you're in the bush, you gotta make it to the clinic, man. That's why I tell people don't if you're from the diaspora, make sure you got some Ghanaians around that can hold you down. Like the time uh I caught it in the central region, a uh, brother carried me like two brothers carried me from like the bush all the way to the roadside which is at least like three miles man so wow. i for, forever appreciate them brothers you know what i'm saying i was really jacked up I, I waited too late to to take it serious um it was not a good idea so um speaking of that you know we have a lot of our people who they feel as if going to Ghana, they need to get all of the herbs. You, you know, I get, I'll take these herbs and I'll, you know, I'll do these. They want to go the natural way of doing things. Um, with you all being in a bush, I'm sure. I would think that maybe you all wanted to try the um, natural course of things, but how did you find yourself when you're sick and you know, is malaria and you need to. I think I think the easiest way is I know my brother, he know me. So if I'm looking in his eyes and then feel like, yo, bro, you you slipping or something, man, I'm like, I don't care what these herbs doing. We doing everything we can right now. You know what I'm saying? If it be the herbs, take the herbs. If it be, let's get to the hospital, let's get to the hospital. It's like, I mean, I guess that's a good thing for us being together. You know, we can tell like, yo man, something's not right. It's not, it's not. And um, on top of that, I just, I just tell people, you know, um, hey man, uh, the, the people there even pass away from it, man. It's a serious thing. It's like, don't play with it. Don't, don't play, play with it. it. That's what I always say. Cause I've had malaria like eight or nine times, but. Mm -hmm. As soon as I start feeling a little something, mm -hmm. I go straight to, I go and I don't even take the pills. I go and get the injection because mm -hmm. I am, I have seen several times where diasporans have been way out somewhere. Nobody knew like one, one brother, God, it, it still haunts me to the day. I had just met him maybe like a month before. And I found out that he had been, he had been, he had been sick with malaria and died in his house. And nobody knew for like 10 days. Mm. And I yeah. was like, but but he was there trying to heal himself with the, the natural way. And I feel like for us, we have to understand that coming from the West, our bodies aren't built like that yet. You gotta, you gotta get there. You can't dive right in and think you're gonna go the natural way with um, malaria. And then malaria isn't even the only thing that you need to think about, you know? Right. You got typhoid, cholera, uh, Baby, what's that um thing that happened during Hama time where your eyes be feeling heavy and uh, it's, uh -oh. I can't remember what the name of it is, but it's several different things that as diasporans, we have no idea about. I've had my, um one time I was in Guinea and I never get breakouts in my face. I woke up one day and my whole face was just covered with some kind of rash. And I had no idea where it came from. And it literally lasted about two weeks. I was mortified. Like, I could not figure out what was going on. And all I could do was think, drink some water, drink, like, flush my system out as much as I could because I didn't know what happened. I don't know if I touched something and touched my face or what, but that had never happened to me in my life. So I can't imagine being out in a bush and getting sick and being three miles away from the road and having to have to get carried to 
the room. Um, I'm glad that y'all are right, but mm-hmm. y'all, I'm sure y'all know to not let you, not let that kind of shit happen. Really? Yeah, we definitely ain't trying to be that far away, you know, without like a way to the roadside. Like if you got to walk every day. Is you're gonna have to get a car or something. And you then know. now we. We keep the over the counter with us as well too. Like, you know what I'm saying? You gotta keep that on deck. And now our bodies can feel malaria at the very beginning, like you said, you know. So um, yeah, we we take every precaution with that thing because you know that that's nothing to play with at all. Yeah. Has there been any other things outside of malaria? Because I think malaria becomes kind of like commonplace. Um once you've been there, it's just kind of like it's right. Cause mm-hmm. I, I cried. I thought I was gonna die the first time I had it, and my husband was like, <laughs> "What you crying for?" I'm like, right. "Oh my god! They say millions of people die from malaria every day, or every year." And I'm like, "I don't want to die." But um, were there any other things that um, like sicknesses that you all maybe came across that you all you may not have been prepared for? Um, I got typhoid once. Um, I got typhoid in the central region. Um, it didn't last that long, okay. you know, but I did have to go to the clinic, plug me up to the IV. I couldn't hold nothing down. Um, it probably lasts like three days and then I was back on my feet. How did you know you had, um, typhoid? What was it about it? What, what well, after, um, I went, um, probably on the like second day that I couldn't eat. Okay, because um, you, you had an experience enough times, you had some yeah. experience, you're like, oh, no, we're not doing this. Straight up, once I couldn't swallow and stuff, I was like, hold up, let's let's just go. And they um they gave me a test, mm-hmm. and um, that's how I found out. Okay, so a lot of people, when they're coming from here, they always have questions like, um, should they get, like, malaria prophylactics from here? Um, they tend to be really expensive here. Um, I, when I'm, even when I'm leaving Ghana, I'll grab me some to bring with me just in case I start feeling sick when I get here. Um, I can go ahead and just pop my little pills and I'll be straight. But, um, would you recommend people to, with your experience, would you recommend people to take malaria prophylactics before they come, especially if they're going into the bush or would you just say, just get it there? I say get it there. Uh, just save you some bread, but if you just want to be extra on the extra, if and you don't know nobody, you can just ride down on a pharmacy with. Um, then yeah, just just get it, just get it before you leave. But it's about the, you know, you want to pay triple the money or quadruple the money for it. It's that's on you. Yeah, because it's 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 literally at every pharmacy you can. Right. <laughs> you can. And it's not even it's not that expensive. You can get it for like what under 20 CDs or something like that. Yep. So um, so just for those out there who may be getting ready to travel or anything to Ghana or to anywhere in West Africa, uh, or Africa for that matter, your malaria is something very common. So getting the medicine there is is quite easy. You can literally just walk into a pharmacy and say that you need malaria prophylactics and they'll Dead. right so switching gears a little bit um you all have is from from what i can see and from what i can um ascertain um from what i saw you all were very much uh in the conscious community, Pan-African community, um, the Black power community, you know, like about our people, right? And there are a lot of people who move to Africa with that in mind. That's that's their ideology. Um, when you moved to Africa, how did you, or when you moved to Ghana, how did you, um, how did you find that there? Go first, bro. Uh, really, I found it in the diaspora community, but not so much in the you know Ghanaian culture, um, so to speak. 
but you know they they operate on a different paradigm to where they ain't coming in contact with like other nationalities as often as far as skin color you know they got every shade of black there but black is not really nothing that they even consider um you know i i feel like there's colorism there to a degree oh, but yeah. as far as uh as far as uh, having a a concept of racism it's really not that and um then I, I noticed they had like a real different understanding of capitalism so uh the the what do you call it like the social economic hierarchy was real rigid and yeah. it, you couldn't move fluent fluent through that so you know pan-africanism really didn't have a place there from where I, from what I was understanding. It was really the energy we was bringing there as diasporans. And a brother was telling me this, you know, we was on Labadi Beach and he was telling me, man, y'all, y'all still Pan-African. And, and he was the brother that kind of grew up like that. And then so I was like, man, he really is like crushing all my little aspects of what I'm seeing. But then he was like, man, I've been here like two or three weeks and I already know there ain't no Pan-Africanism going on. And I was like, wow, I've been here a year and I'm still, you know. Still holding on to it, yeah. (laughs) Right, so. I I think many of us um, do that. We hold on so tight to the ideals that we have from here of what Africa is supposed to be like. And then we kind of get there and it's like, Okay, well maybe I'm maybe I'm just around the wrong people. Or maybe right. I need to, you know, because it can't be this bad. Like, what the hell is going on? So um yeah, so the, has, the, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, um, to think about it, to me that same brother was like, um, you build a nation by having strong families and he was just talking about how the future and everything and he was and I guess that's why we ended up staying so long in the bush we was going in and out of the city a lot and then it was like man now nah, we just need to stay here and focus on like what you know the the ideals that we had in the states we really got to implement them over there so if if we not gonna just like in in many ways start over with this whole pan-african thing because like I said, we gotta we gotta learn the language, we gotta interact with these, we gotta like really be pan African with it. Like, I mean, put everybody's culture together, see what we need to to take out, see what we need to add in. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you from the UK? Oh, you from the Caribbean? Oh, you from oh whatever. Let's what you know. But until we got that um that foundation, it's just really just a lot of cap. Yeah. You know, for me, I've seen one person who completely embodies what I feel is Pan-Africanism, and that's Obadale Cambon and his yep. family. They have, I taught, with, I taught at his school, I taught science at um, his school for a little while, and just being around him and his family and just and seeing like, he does not allow his family to speak English inside of their house. They have to speak either tree or medu uh, something. It has to be an African language that you um, communicate in, in their household. And to see how he like, he would, he would teach the, the kids um, cap, what is it, Caprera, Caprera, the, yeah, he was, he was teaching them that, and it was just so, he, like, lives it, like, live it, live it, right there in Africa, that was, him and his family have been the only people that I really feel like live it, they, like, really live it, outside of that, like you said, I think the rest of it is just cap, like, Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people, um, kind of monetize it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Shout out to that brother, man. Because yeah, I, I did had a had a um opportunity to meet him a couple times. Shout out to him, man. Big up to him and his fam. But um yeah, man, like 
it takes a lot. It takes a lot of doing. It's it, you have to put effort and energy into making that happen. And uh, yeah, man. Yeah. So why do you think so many people are feeling disenfranchised with the Pan African conscious Black Power type community? Um, Tyree or Titus, each one. Either. Uh, I think I think first and foremost, it doesn't come with nothing tangible. It's all uh, it's all just concepts and ideologies and pathologies that just doesn't transfer into tangible things that I can put in my pocket or take to the bank and make a deposit. You know what I mean? So um, I really think that's where the game changed for us when we went to Ghana. And they was like, man, I don't care, man. Where's the CDs at? You know what I'm saying? They don't really worry about you know, the gold is under the ground. If it if it's got CDs on it, they really serious about it. So they kind of put me in a different um in a different mental space. So being in Africa and seeing how the conscious community was just raging in the gender war and all these debates and all these uh it's getting into spiritual, you know. You know, I, I find it funny how it's like the African spirituality is getting picked up now, but just like the actual way of life of, you know, the natural people that's in Africa, you know, living off the land or whatever, they don't want to pick up that one. They don't want to pick up like arranging marriages. They just want to argue about, you know, men and women not being getting along. Or, you know what I'm saying? Or just like, it seems like we just want to keep talking. And that's why I feel like it's been lost its power yeah um titus what would you say is the um like the single most um disappointing uh thing about what like being in a part of the conscious community because for, for me it's always seemed as if there's so much talk and not enough action behind the talk is everybody want to do panels and talk about this and talk about they want to the, the women talking about the men and the men talking about the women instead of us actually coming together what is it what is missing like what it, what is that thing that's missing to make it happen um i just put it as far as like me and bro go like we we two different people but we got a, a destination that's so precise that no matter how much we got differences, we like, man, it's this destination. And you'd be surprised how much you sacrifice and how much you just like give up your own wants just to make it here. You feel me? Like, with, oh, yeah. and, and you're thinking about this person, he's giving up the same amount. You ain't gonna let him sacrifice more than you you ain't going to have him throw it back up in your face later on. Like you didn't, you didn't break bread when you were supposed to break bread or this and this and that. Um, we so objective based and, and, you know, we even write down what liberation really look like. You know what I'm saying? Right. How we going to be living? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What is be our code and our law? And, and when we get there, you know what I mean? Um, these are the type of things that just, it keep you lit. And when somebody say, um, we're going to put this much bread in, you you be the first to throw it in the pot. You know what I'm saying? Because you you can see it, you know? Yeah. But I feel like it, with this whole thing with consciousness, it gets so vague and lofty that you you can't even see it in, as, a, as a destination. Yeah, I, I, I totally, totally agree with you. Um, I think one of my problems is that as you mentioned, is like, we have to have a common vision. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you an African traditionalist, a Christian, a Muslim, a, a, a atheist, or what, put all that shit to the side. What about this common goal? We all wanna be, we all wanna be liberated. Does, do we all have the same idea of what liberation looks like? Do we all, have the same um, concept of what liberation looks like. And if that's the case, I don't care who you pray to. I don't, I don't right. care about that. That has absolutely nothing. You do that shit in your house. Mm -hmm. 
wherever and when we together, that's not even part of the conversation. The conversation is liberation for, for, for us black folks and getting from up under this, this uh, the thumb of oppression that these people have us under everywhere. Um, in your live, y'all, you mentioned um, that, how did you say, I'm trying to remember how you said it. You said that the people, oh God, I can't remember. I'm gonna remember in a minute and I'm gonna come back to it. But um, I was going into this whole, how do we, you know, come together? Is there a, is there a thing? Oh, you y'all mentioned um, that the diaspora needs to be like a tribe, right? And, you know, a lot of times when we're coming to Ghana, or whatever so many people there's a lot of us who want to build like communities or whatever and um then there's a whole another sect of us who feels like we shouldn't build communities we shouldn't um we should just live amongst the people and um that's it like we should just try to assimilate as quickly as we possibly can which to me is bullshit because at the end of the day is probably going to be our children who are completely assimilated um and that should be the goal because we all grown at this point uh, right. so how do you feel about that how do you feel about the idea of us having our own um tribes i think people don't understand like how tribal ghana is and how much how much power comes in numbers and then who you are i can identify you you are for the lack of a better word you are fihankra so mm -hmm. um this your people can y'all explain to people why that shit is so damn important man. You want me to go? oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. you go you I'll go drop. Man. Drop no, on man i just think about I think about how um, if we just take a moment to see how other nationalities come to the States and just look at it, yo, for the, just economically, like for real, it's so important. And not to say we exclude or this and that, but like, why wouldn't you want to do business with the, the folks that came from the same spot? And, um, and the whole deal to me is like, I found that a lot of the diasporans that was already there, they had information and tools to give to me that, you know, I wouldn't have understood coming from a Ghanaian. And just because, you know, we came from the, the same background, that's the reason why it came down like that. So um, for just economics and having the same, um, you know, uh, the like- The background and understanding, yeah. we, because I found myself, when we first moved to Ghana in 2014, I found myself, while I had my family, and it was me and my, my husband is Ghanaian, um, so his family, would, I still would feel like out of place because they're speaking, they're not even speaking tree, they're speaking Sisala. So I'm mm. like, I'm completely lost. And Sisala is a really thick language. Like it's a thick, it's hard. It is so hard. And um, there's so many, it's just so many layers to it. But once I found like minds that were from here and I was able to go and sit and fellowship with them and really talk about what I was dealing with in Ghana and they had been there for years already. And they were able to, like you said, give me an understanding of different things that I couldn't really wrap my mind around. They had tools that I needed. And it would have been easier if we stayed closer together. Because if I'm coming from McCarthy Hill and you live in Spintex or you live in Tema, 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's or I live in McCarthy Hill and you live in um, the Eastern region or something of that nature. It, it, it doesn't make it, we hardly even get to see each other because the yep. distance is so so big and people do have lives. But if we live to, live closer together, it's easier to just stop by such and such house or whatever the case may be, or somebody can come and check on you. Um, and I feel like for security reasons, yep, for that's security it. reasons, we should be together because at the end of the day, who gonna take care of you? Like who gonna look out for you? Y'all have each other, but it's a lot of people who are going by themselves and because their family here ain't going. So they just say, fuck it. I'm gonna just go on and go by myself. But where's the community that you're gonna go into so that you can be straight? And that, that's why I appreciate the work they're doing down there at the Cebu um, thing uh, in the central region. It's, you know, it's a diaspora project where, you know, they building, you know, uh, you know, residential communities and stuff. And I, at first I was, I had mixed feelings about it, but I see it's a necessary thing, even though it's going to take a lot of years and a lot of work. Um, but just to have that one community that you can all link up to, even though you got projects maybe outside of the area, you know, where, where are you going to meet up as a central headquarters if, if something drastic happens that they, you know, come up with a deportation system trying to, you know, uh, any old types of things that you you How can't foresee. Each other. Right. Like, right. and I, I don't think people understand, like, like, for instance, when I was in Guinea, I was in Guinea for almost two years. And what I noticed was like, um, you had the Fulani, the Mandinka, um, and the Susu were the two top um, groups in Conakry, or the three top groups in Conakry. And, but the two top ones, um, the, the Mandinka and the Fulani were always battling with each other over power. It's always a struggle over the power. The Fulani feel like they should be running things. The Mandinka feel like they should be running things. And because we are from the outside, we just see, it just look like it's black folks to us not understanding the the depth of the tribalism that is on the continent um mm -hmm. and then when you come so i feel like you see these people they come to america and in america i live in atlanta so very black place lots of different nationalities but we have certain areas where you know like this is where a lot of this is where the africans live at Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to find people from the Gambia, from Ghana, from Nigeria, from Ethiopia, Kenya, all, and it's all in the same general region, the same general area. It's about three different areas like that here in Atlanta where you're going to, and my husband got here, I don't know how they find each other, but they do. And even though we stay outside of that, when he needs something or he needs some, he can go into that community and find what he needs, be it just food or whatever the case may be. Um, somebody's like my husband's shipper is Ghanaian. Mm. His um, the guy who tows cars for him because he he has his um, car business. The guy who tows the cars for him is Ghanaian. Um, everybody that he does business with, for the most part, is either Ghanaian or Nigerian. And it's because that's more comfortable. Granted, he got his, Afri I just heard him talking to an African-American brother the other day. They calling each other. You would think these people knew each other all their life. What's up, nigga? You know, like, it felt to me, just listening to it, they felt like it felt like they really have a good bond as far as their whatever that relationship is. But he still have his his people, and if I'm sure if he needed some, if something was, we've had situations here where we was coming back from Ghana, and we needed some a place to land, and he just like, hey, such and such, I need one of your rooms. So that me and my family can land, we'll be there about a week and we'll be gone. And it's like, no problem, no problem. And I think we need that. 
we need that kind of thing in Ghana, especially with so many of us coming. Um, or you said you came with two other brothers. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel like they left? Well, um, the the one brother, um, he went. We went to college with him. You know what I'm saying. So we was the same age, and uh, he had a really good job in the states. You know what I'm saying. So he had a whole different pr pr perspective on the trip to Ghana than we did necessarily. And so um, we was there for a while, and we we kind of went our separate ways since you know he had a nest egg. You know what I'm saying? So he wasn't going to the bush. I mean, he went to see it, but he wasn't gonna stay there. And so I felt him and, um, you know, so he lived in like posh places, you know what I mean? Real high rise hotels, he was just renting for a month. Like, you know, just, you know, cause he didn't want, he didn't want to go there. So um, I really feel like he left because he wanted to go back to work. You know what I'm saying? He didn't, he couldn't find work especially the, the type of pay cut he would have took man it's just unheard of you know what i mean yeah. so that's why he left then uh the younger brother we was with edward man so, i mean i hate to you know put his name out there but this brother is so solid man he's he's you know he's my man's in them and so uh he came back because you know he is is his money and everything and uh different stuff was going on. He, he had brought his girl over to Ghana and she left. And so he was dealing with that heartbreak. Yeah. He, he didn't, you know what I'm saying? And so time time really took a toll on him. He, you know, we all learned a lot from that experience. And, you know, we still keep in contact with him to this day, so. Um, the beautiful thing about it, like I see, I see them, both of them brothers coming back because what happens when you go to Ghana specifically, it get in you and, you know, is I, I see both of them brothers coming back because it, they like when we do communicate about it it's all like yo i love to go back to ghana type situation so um to me um when people go back and forth and like run into like different issues like it's the same with us man this is our fourth time going we never even considered another uh african country even though all of the crazy crazy things that's been happening mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just we going back to Ghana. Going back to Ghana. I, yeah. It's a, it's a, I tell people it's like a, I don't know. I don't, with all of the shit in Ghana, really? like, Ghana will make you want to just punch somebody in the face. Like, but at the same time, it's a, it's like a love hate situation, but more love than hate, you know? Uh, it's, well, I'll say more like a, a love dislike situation because right. that is so in my heart and i want to ask y'all like y'all getting ready to go back to ghana um and you know you've learned a lot along the way you it's been some years now so what what things that you learn from your past that you're taking into going back that you think will make this time better for you all? Go first, bro. Um, what we learned is that we are, being a foreigner has its good and its bad. It's best that you embrace that and try to maneuver as a foreigner than trying to blend in as a Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. um, Wow. The more, the more, the more we try to just be a regular person, the harder the whole thing was. Like the intensity of like just going into a uh, certain type of environments as a foreigner, it's best if you just be the foreigner. Don't try to, you know, even though you can speak the language and everything like that, they know you're not from there. So you might as well just, just keep it a buck. So, uh, that's one thing. And another thing is that like, man, family is important in Ghana, like way more so than what we consider is in the States. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, we got cousins, we got, you know, you know, family and that's, that's that. But in Ghana, 
it runs a little deeper and you know what I'm saying? It runs, well, it runs a lot deeper. You know what I'm saying? You can go to the shrine and see how deep the family goes back. You know, they got a history. And that's why I say, you know, when you was talking about the tribes over in, um, what you say to, you know, in the country you was at. Um, mm-hmm. In Guinea. In Guinea, yeah. The tribes over there, you know, those tribes, you know, is, is they're never going to go away. They might even split off into more and more tribes, but they'll never not hang on to that heritage. And I think that's what we need to kind of look at it as, as we go over there. There's no way um, you're going to take away the tribalism in Africa. So just embrace it, you know what I'm saying? And hope your children can just, you know what I'm saying, maneuver in that when, when you have, when you, when they get there too. Yeah. I want to add to that. Um, like I learned that a lot of the small talking, you could just skip that, you know, even with, with our Ghanaian brothers and sisters and um, African American or diasporan community, um, just get to straight objectives. And if they, they feel it, they feel it. If they don't, they don't um, just get, get down to business. Um, we did a lot of the uh, pageants and partying and all that sh- Man, that shit dead, man. It's like, ain't nobody got time for that no more. I'm thinking about, all, yeah, my my people. I I mean, just just dealing with the cold right now in the states. I'm, this is whack. Oh my god, this is so whack. This is so <laughs> whack. Like, Titus, let me tell you, I literally walked outside yesterday and I got so angry. I was like, man, what the fuck is this? I need some fun. <laughs> oh God, it's cold as fuck. <laughs> this is bullshit, man. Like for real, for real. It's this cold over here. Yeah. And, and I'm a, I know I'm gonna take that that fire and just burn when I get to gun. Like I'm gonna be so like just the drive. It's like man, my people is in that cold, cold, cold. They dreaming about coming over here, and we ain't even got a spot for them to lay their head. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, but like, it's just, it's just so much inside me. Like, I'm like, man, I'm gonna, if, if whatever it takes, we gonna get the machines the whatever, the whatever we got to make this thing crack, man. Like, get- and I, I really appreciate y'all, um, for having that, that love, um, uh, for, for the people. Um, and I think people can't possibly understand how layered repatriation is um, and how important. I have been telling people for years and years and years now that one of the most important things for you to do when you're in Ghana is to build relationships. Building relationships will make or break you. And those were, you have to be strategic with those relationships. I'm not saying you have to be, um, I don't know what's another um, it, it shouldn't be like a bad thing to be strategic about your relationships it's a good thing to be strategic about your relationships because in Ghana it's it's a small country like it's a very small country and there's probably like maybe one or two degrees of separation there so it's like you know you know this person that person probably knows somebody else that you know and especially within the repatriation community. Um, so your name got to, you got to keep your name good. You got to keep your name good. And you got to keep your integrity high. It's, it's so many people. It's so many people. I will not say nobody's name, but it's so many people who, like for instance, the other day I was talking to somebody about um, this COVID-19 mandate thing. And I was saying that, you know, I was, there was a brother, this, that, and a third, and they was like, "Uh, no, don't trust that brother there. Don't trust that brother. And I'm like, why? Like, and then they just like ran down a whole list of things that this brother had had done or had allegedly done. And I was just like, oh, like, and it's like people, 
they're like, you don't need to mess with nobody or don't know him or nobody who's associated with him because they all do the same thing. And I'm like, okay, so there needs to come a point where we do some name and, and we need to do some Anas type shit when it comes Real. to our diaspora because we do have people who are preying on um, on our folks. Um, I do want, I'm gonna ask y'all a, a, I'm gonna ask y'all a question after I start recording <laughs> because it's something I need to kind of keep hmm. my brains about. <laughs> But <laughs> I know y'all already know where I'm going. <laughs> no. But um, if is there anything else y'all want to want the people to know before we um close out? Uh, I want to just say that you don't have to repatriate to go see Ghana. You know what I'm saying? You can go just to visit. You can go on vacation. You can go on, you know. Extended holiday. You know what I'm saying? You can go on an employee retreat. You can just go sit on the beach and kick your feet up, man. That's 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 what I want to tell people. Like, Ghana is a nice vacation spot, man. So don't stress yourself out trying to repatriate if you just, you know, want to see, you know, want to see, see the place. Just go and visit, man. See it for yourself. That's all. Okay. Um, what I want to say, um, as far as uh just this whole thing, um, you know, if you if you are Pan African or those are some of the ideas you hold, um just be objective based with that and and know that all of those, you know, ancestors that wrote those books and scholars and stuff. They was waiting on us to really implement it. So it's gonna take time. Um, just realize like what unity is and, and what it's not. And and when you go to, to Africa or any country, wherever, just know where you're at. Um, it's, it's, it's a difference and, and just, um, yeah, man, do your research, man. Shout out to the research crew. Do your research. I can't say that. No, that's the thing that attracted me to listening to you brothers from the very beginning was the fact that you all talk so much about doing the research. Because at the end of the day, if you don't do your research, you may find yourself in a peculiar situation. And Ghana, Ghana is Ghana is Ghana. <laughs> like it's so hard yes, to explain to people. <laughs> Ghana is Ghana, and it it is a uh, it has all of its precious inconveniences, and you gotta love it. You gotta oh my god, you can't help but love it. It's home. I find peace there. I find my I find my space there. Like I find myself able to be myself. Like I don't know what that is, but I feel more like who I am. And I think it's the freedom that mm -hmm. you gain from being there. Um, I don't think our Ghanaian brothers and sisters really understand how free they are. Um, and with that being said, I wanna thank you brothers so, so much for always having such a great conversation. Glad to have both of y'all on. And thank you. as I close out, I want y'all to hang on, but this has been Breaking the Chains, and we'll see you later.